basically you're just going to have to sit back and enjoy the ride and compared to any other video conferencing tool you will find all of your facilitator commands to the left side of your screen so that's where you find the mic you find the video the react button feel free to click those and use them throughout the session they're just silently floating around and miram and thomas will appreciate if you kind of react throughout the session so we know that you're with them the music you hear in the background every single one of you has full control over that um, volume at the bottom of the screen so we'll be playing music here and there i'll kill it for now and we have a packed agenda and so i do want to uh, welcome everyone and introduce our guests or hosts and i'll just spotlight them here a little bit this is going to look a bit weird. Yay, there we go. It's like school and you're the teachers. Isn't this fun? <laughs> um, I am absolutely giddy the whole day because I have been following Miriam and Thomas for what feels like forever. I am appreciative of every opportunity I get to hang out with them, whether it's in a session or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Miriam is a facilitation evangelist and the host of the super famous, renowned Workshops Work podcast. It's the first podcast I ever listened to when I got into this world of facilitation, brought me forward really fast. Uh, she also curates a global online community of 100 experts, surely even more by now, called Never Done Before. Her passion is to host workshops which deliver results through deeply fostered connection, surprise, a sense of unity among participants. And she's joined by Thomas, who is, I don't know if on the spectrum, I guess we'll have to see what their flavors is, um, is a rebel facilitator. And I love that. If you're familiar with his work, you know why that is. Uh, the origin of his work stems in crisis and conflict management. And at the moment revolves at this intersection between human dynamics, innovation, and disruptive change. Uh, he is driven by pushing boundaries, breaking with conventions, and playing with disruption as key driver for transformational experiences. Feel free to add to that introduction. Welcome, and to take it away, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this warm introduction, Anna Maria. Um, same goes back to you. Um, and thank you for inviting us. Um, and I think from the short introduction of our profiles, um, everyone can already sense that Thomas and I are pretty much on different sides of the spectrum. I am the German one, the timekeeper, the structured one, um, and Thomas is the rebel, um, the emergent one. And still, we love to co-facilitate. Who would have thought that? We actually just did two days ago, uh, which was, was, as always, a fun experience because when two things come together that are very different, something new emerges and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. But also from my side, welcome. It's exciting. I haven't been here in a while, uh, I realized. So it's nice to be back and it's nice to see some familiar and some new faces. And yeah, don't want to talk too much because we have a tight agenda. As Anna Maria said, thank you very much for your nice introduction, Anna Maria. And um, are we ready to go? Are we ready to kick it off? Yes, okay. I would take this as a yes. Then Miriam and I have prepared some statements for you to kick this off. And we, will, we would like you to react depending on whether you agree or disagree with that statement. Okay? I put them in the chat and we read them out. And then you can use the reactions whether you Good. agree or with agree. So let's... Start with the first one. No workshop without an agenda. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Okay, I see some thumbs up, some thumbs down. A lot of thumbs up. Number two. Oh, big thumbs up. Um, <laughs> and sometimes uh, people just don't mind. Number <laughs> two. I love the way actually. <laughs> Number two, there is a right way to facilitate, which means there's also a wrong way to facilitate. Everyone agrees. Yeah, to nobody that. agrees with that. Interesting. Or I didn't at least see a thumbs up. Okay. Wow. Good. 
there's a lot more alignment than we expected, at least on this one. Um, the next one is no workshop without a whiteboard. Everyone agrees to disagree. Few thumbs up. Okay. I see my tribe. They're hidden. They're hidden amongst the thumbs down, but um, you are there. Uh, there's another one. Number four. <laughs> Consensus is the goal of a workshop. Hmm. Lots of no's. Okay. I actually. Getting more and more curious to actually hear a few voices. Yeah, me too. Should we should we get some? Because that, that yes. one actually yes. makes me curious. Consensus is the goal of a workshop. Where does a no come from? And maybe someone will answer yes. Who dares? You can cure yourself up or just unmute and share. I'm happy to to give a reason for why I think consensus is a goal, but I, uh, I, you may have wanted to hear why someone said no first. Please go no. ahead. Um, I, I think it depends on people's interpretation of the word, right? Consensus. I, I think you're always trying to achieve some kind of consensus. Is my personal interpretation. It could be. It doesn't need to be grand or huge. That do we agree on this new company strategic direction or this? new philosophy or approach that we're going to take or this new technology i think you're trying to get a sense of how people feel get all the views out on the table and then agree i wouldn't have used the word consensus personally but I, trying to read in between the lines i would have said we want to agree sort of you know how we broadly feel as a as a, as, as a group uh, most of the sessions that i feel i've facilitated i've always had some kind of goal in mind and i, and I think it's just down to people's interpretation about what goal and consensus mean Thank you. The devil lies in the details, right? Just checking that someone in the in the chat who seems to have challenges with the sound. Uh, is that just you? I will, I will just I will just take the all of the things. Yeah. So okay, can... great. And Marina has a comment. Pro or against consensus, Marina? Marina, I see you talking, but you're on mute. Mm. All right. It it doesn't look like you can unmute yourself. Is that is that right? Okay. I'll have a look at that. In a second, feel free to use the chat. I don't know why you don't. You can't do that. Anyone else who thinks that consensus is not the goal of a workshop? I was an. It depends because every workshop's different. So I might do a workshop where I actually want people to have very different views, and maybe we're not trying to get to consensus. But sometimes, and a lot of the time, you absolutely do want to get to consensus. Okay. Thank you. Good. Great. So yeah, and both uh, both times we heard that uh, yeah, it depends, and um, words create worlds. And I think that that's what something we'll get to, back to throughout this workshop a few few times. Yeah. So uh, next one, um, facilitators are not supposed to share their perspectives. Do you agree? Do you agree or disagree? Or disagree. Can I have a bonus one? Facilitators must be neutral. Agree or disagree? Okay. Ah, oh, there's a difference. Mm, again, sharing the perspective versus being neutral. Where's the difference? Um, I think we need more than one hour. <laughs> Last but not least. This one is for me. Facilitators must keep the time. Mostly oh. yes. Some dare to say no. 
interesting. Way more alignment than I expected, got to be honest. Um, but we'll see, as we already heard from that comments in uh, regarding to to the one com uh, to the one statement we had, a lot of things lie in the details. And this is also where this workshop comes in, because it's either details that you could call it, or you could call it spectrum. And that's what we call it because there is so much to explore when it comes to facilitation that it would actually be a bit sad if we bound us ourselves to the one way to the one thing to the one right approach to do so and when miriam and i started working together this is now almost five years ago uh, when we got to know each other uh, and when we after our first conversations had recurring conversations after that and geeked out about facilitation as many of you probably do as well and once we, we start our conversations, there's always something we dive in, one rabbit hole, We within five minutes, we usually find that one. And what very quickly came out is that we are not necessarily doing things, or all things the same way. Some things we do very much alike, and other things we have very, very, sim very, very different preferences. But those preferences are not only about as often as reduced to style, for example. That's just one thing. But it's a lot of small details, it's, it's preparation, it's what you do afterwards, it's what the formats you, you, you work on. So there's a lot of those things. Um, but what we also talked, and now I throw the ball over to you, Miriam, is about assumptions. Mm. Yeah. And before the assumptions, I want to come back to the details and the it depends. So yes, many of these statements were it depends statements. And it not only depends on the context, but it also depends on us as a facilitator. Um, and this is where the spectrum, the assumptions come in, but also our what we call signatures. Because sometimes it just depends on us. Do we feel um, comfortable with that or not? Must facilitators be neutral? Um, maybe for some it depends, and many others have very strong opinions about that. So for instance, I'm very neutral when it comes to the content. Um, when it comes to the output, sorry, they own the output um, and the outcome. So I am neutral about that. But otherwise, yes, I do have my opinions um, and I cannot shut up. Others might have different opinions and it depends on the hat that we are wearing. So when we very often, and this is um, why, and this comes now to the assumptions, we hear these big statements when we learn to facilitate. And I found this very interesting. Um, the two statements were um, facilitators must never share their perspectives um, as opposed to must be neutral. And one assumption is facilitators must be neutral. Everyone shouts, hooray, yes, this is what we do. Um, and then what does it mean? And what does it mean to you and to us? And how can we, is it worth questioning this assumption? Another assumption is that uh, facilitators have to um, to keep the time. What if we don't? What if the participants keep the time? Or what if we don't keep the time? And what about open space where it ends when it ends and it's the best time to end? So when we speak about spectrum and we speak about assumptions, um, it's always good to question our assumptions and also to feel into our own integrity and where we stand with our own way of doing things. And I, I think what is like when you think of that first statement where probably there was most disagreement between the group here uh, about the agenda. Now, I have a I have a very clear stand on that. Like even if I have an agenda, I my participants don't get it. Um, so it's so the question is, does that answer this with yes or no? Um, I've also done workshops completely without agenda and there are formats where that's the case. But then I also know a lot of facilitators who would never sign up to that. And maybe some of you are are facilitators like that. And yeah, Miriam and I, we're very different when it comes to that because for that, there's different reasons. And it doesn't always have to be only about the participants. It doesn't always have to be only about the results. It can just simply be like, that's the way we, our minds work, right? We have to have it on paper instead of just in our minds. We have to have maybe an anchor or something to fall back on, or we like to have it just simply spelled out so there's a lot of different reasons it's not always about like yeah facilitation requires an agenda that's not necessarily it but who are you on that spectrum do you lean towards that more 
or do you lean towards the other way? And one of the things that, that, that we try to push people to is to reflect why that's the case, not only to sort yourselves on this spectrum, but actually go a step beyond. Because this is what we in our conversations have explored. Because we, I asked Miriam, why do you need an agenda? Or why do you need the structure? What is what is important for you and vice versa? Why she, she asked, so why are you so against sharing the agenda? And that's when you really find out, okay, um, this is why I'm standing on this. And this is why I need this. And facilitation, and that, that is something that is recurring in, in our our work, both of us uh, are very much really pushing for that is starts with us as facilitators, knowing ourselves in that process. And this is kind of where we where we go a little bit with this workshop today as well. It's just about like looking a little bit in the mirror, just deducting a little bit from the way we, we work, from the preferences that we have, where we would position ourselves on that spectrum. And you see there's there will you will see there's lots of categories on that spectrum and we'll just look at a few of those today. Yeah. And to kick that off and also to get you um, a little bit more active into the game, we want to start with a little chatterfall um, and ask you what is one keyword that describes your facilitation? So Thomas, for instance, was introduced with disruption. Others might call it discomfort. I'm definitely the structured one, maybe even the science one. Fun, empathy, cooperation, guidance, nurturing, empathetic, practical, visual, queer mind, responsive, radically present, surprise, guidance, coaching, joyful, so many different ones. Beautiful. And we'll use this um, chatterfall and openness of thoughts and hopefully got you thinking um, to go into small groups of three. We call these turn to your neighbor moments. Um, I say we, I mean, I, um, I love this um, I'd never done before. We call them turn to your neighbor moments. So um, imagine you're in a physical room um, and the most natural thing you would do, you would sit down and then turn to your neighbor and say hello and maybe share a few words. So we would like to invite you to do this with your neighbor to the left and the neighbor to your right and be aware that the butter gods will decide who your neighbors are. <laughs> The butter god. I was standing six minutes in groups of three. Six minutes, exactly, in groups of three. And I put the instructions in the chat. So I will also broadcast. What's your one keyword that explains your facilitation and share why? Enjoy the conversation. Enjoy. See you back in six. Scrum Master? Yep. Hey, hey. Cool. All right. Everyone. Sorry, slowly. I'm eating breakfast and talking. That's why my That's camera okay. is That's okay. Enjoy your <laughs> breakfast. It's, it is, you don't have to be on camera. Enjoy your breakfast. I'm happy you can. I'm happy you joined us. Uh, we're slowly trickling back in after chatting with our neighbors. I totally stole that this one from Miriam. I'm using this one so often, the turn to your neighbor. All right, we're slowly coming back. I see. Also turn to a neighbor, it was wonderful. Thank you, Regina. Yay, there we go. It's, um, it's so important, especially when we're in large groups, to just feel a little bit less alone. Um, awesome, I see all the beautiful reactions. Good. Anyone who wants to share one word of, do we have time? Yeah, we have time. Yeah, we can hear from maybe two, if you would like to share just a reaction after the turn to your neighbor. What came up? Thomas has time. He doesn't work with an agenda. So it's like, we can do whatever, right? We've got time. He's working with a German one, right? <laughs> And that's and that's the that's the scary part. So I'm always the squeeze. We have time so. with a time timer. 
I'm going to go Priscilla Oh, go on, yeah. Stephen. Yeah, I was going to nominate Saeed. He has a great blend of two words that I think is part of his brand. So, Saeed, explain your, your portmanteau. Yes, thanks for putting me on the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, it's also the word I shared in the chat. I'm, a, I'm not 100% a facilitator, maybe 30%, and then there is 50% of um, entertaining and maybe another 40% of being a geek. I know this does not sum up to 100%, but but still, I'm also not good at, at math. Um, so it's just a, a um, facilitating in a engaging way, in a fun way, and making workshops don't feel like they are actual work. So eliminating the word work out of a workshop, and probably you don't even realize we are working on something until the thing is over, and oh, I'll, maybe we have an outcome that's great, or maybe we learned something, and it was still something you enjoyed instead of, okay, I have to be here rather than yeah, I want to be here because this is like a nice format to join. Thank you. Something else that came up in the conversation of one keyword that explains your facilitation? I'll add really quickly that in my group, we decided we all want to facilitate together because we like each other's words. Like mine was fun. We had empathy and then problem solving. So we would make a perfect group. The magic triangle. Beautiful. Which is, yeah, the combination of the different ones is a, a beautiful bridge to our next activity. We have prepared a mirror board Hashtag no workshop without a whiteboard. No workshop without a whiteboard. Before we share the mirror board, um, the task on the mirror board, you will see a couple of categories. And uh, these are just categories we picked now. So as I said before, there's lots of categories how you could kind of really explore this spectrum. So all sorts of categories. You might have some categories in mind and they might not be represented on this, on, on this mirror board. But we invite you also to beyond this workshop, actually take some time maybe with, with some people you meet here or other colleagues or friends or family and sit down and explore these categories for yourself that you have in mind and that might not show up. Your task now is to, uh, to, it's also written out on the mirror board, but you will see these categories and we invite you to put yourselves on these respective categories where you are. Try not to be influenced by the others and really reflect on what is, what is it that I feel works best for me? Uh, where am I? And where would I place myself on that spectrum or the categories that we've chosen? So you see the facilitation spectrum here in the middle. And you can use the little, um, the little icons to put them on a scale. So these and the little person um, just indicates the middle of the scale. And it makes a little wide to load for some people just yeah. so you know. We might not be seeing it yet. It's slowly and, coming up. And take your time and really just, just reflect where is it um, that you put yourself and then follow your own profile a little bit afterwards. But first and foremost, enjoy this process. I'll put some music for us in the background. Do let me know in the chatting is any of you is running into any troubles accessing the mirror board and we're happy to share the link as well if you have any ad blockers or anything that might prevent this from, from opening in, in butter. Okay, we already see Charla. We're, we're, um, we're sharing the link um, in a second, Charla. Maybe Thomas, can you drop it in the uh, chat as well? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I put on some music for us. Remember that you control the volume if it's too loud for you. You can I even remember turn it. that there is no right or wrong. It's just a combination that makes us unique.
Nice, Steffi. There is some diversity, although you can see that it. Uh, one night in the disco, on the outskirts of Bristol, I was losing with my favorite gang. The place was so boring. And it may play the MC a little bit, um, because I was just coming out of a conversation with about the session that facilitation is for. About courses and where we learn to facilitate. And we're actually shocked that 80% of the facilitators um, haven't any certification or accreditation. And this is very aligned with the agnostic facilitator at the moment. That's interesting. I would love to dig deeper into that topic actually. Because it's great to build our own tools if we know what we're doing. We start building our own tools without knowing. And I would be curious what the Tina means with her comment in the chat if she would like to speak to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, even just the first one, the audience that I'm delivering, if I'm delivering to a bunch of engineers, um, you know, they might want something different for their creativity than if I'm delivering to a marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, so just my opinion on how I facilitate or how I want to do it may be different. And I have to, as a facilitator, always be adapting to my audience. Um, so I just, as I was answering it, I was taking in my own opinion. But then I thought about it. I was like, oh, well, different groups want different things from me as a facilitator. So um, I think that's important. Thank you. It reminded me of another category that could be on this, which isn't on there, but do you focus on the group or do you focus on the individual? Mm, I love that. Yes. Which is a discussion that we've recently had in a, in a course a lot where people ask, so how do you kind of strike the balance between the two and what is actually the one and what's the other and when, when to focus on what? And it turned out that we have very different approaches to this. Which, which could easily, we could fall in the assumption trap, as we mentioned before, to say like, well, it's all about the group and it's all about the group's needs. And, but is the that... Apple. It's, so. Another one could be, it's all about the group versus it's all about the client. So whom are we serving? Are we serving the client um, and their expected results? Are we serving the group and their needs? So we have to come back, Anna Maria. Great. Um, just, just say the word. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do we notice? What do you notice, Thomas? Do you want to start? Me? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I not notice a nice spread. Uh, there is a few categories which seem to be more aligned, um, but generally, there is quite a nice spread. Um, there was, of course, categories which were dependent a lot of interpretation, like small groups only, what does small mean versus what does large mean. So there was also clearly noticeable some uh, some interpretations, but there is some clear alignments, for example, that I, I would say almost all the group likes to play in one or the other way. Um, but then there's very interesting spreads here in the subject matter experts, which I would love to hear some voices too. Uh, that because here we are really spread out over the whole spectrum. So maybe some of you could could uh, to share what where you placed yourself roughly and and what made you place yourself in this position on both ends of the scale. Yeah, Marina. This, this time I think I can unmute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, my uh, my mine went kind of towards the middle because I think we do need to be um, content neutral, but at the same time to have enough context to be able to like understand the uh, the conversation and be prepared on what the team is going to be talking about. So if something arises, we would know what to do. So I wouldn't say I go in as an expert, but I personally like to be prepared and be able to understand what is happening if um, the subject matter expertise is very much maybe outside of what I'm used to talking about. Um, if it's about like a workshop for accountants, I would really read up on accounting or really the subject that we're talking about beforehand, as an example. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And would I, can I jump in? Yeah, come on. Um, and I might uh, read your thoughts or you might have the same thought that when we speak about a workshop and when we speak about facilitation, what do we actually mean? Because there is the facilitator with a capital F um, and the facilitator with a capital F is in charge of the process. And then there is, um, are those who facilitate and they might not be facilitators. Um, and some trainers call themselves facilitators with a capital F and they are in charge of content because otherwise there's nothing to train. So, um, Coming back to what Thomas said, um, be aware of the assumptions that when we talk about content, what is the role you're taking when you're stepping into the space? And then in, in adding on to that, I think it's important to, because I see that we, or I guess we both uh, see that, that specifically facilitators who are at the beginning of their careers, they often get uncertain when they're then in groups and are being challenged on on the process or suggestions that they make or exercises that they choose and uh and that's when it really is is also important to remember in a way we, we were hired for precisely that expertise so while we can say it's all about the group we still have a responsibility for the process we we are the ones who own the process so that's what we kind of hired for so this is always kind of the balance to to keep in mind when we move within that space and still, I think it's um, it's good to to know for ourselves where do we where do we want to be. So, are we more on the maybe content um, intensive side, the subject matter side? Because if we like to train, if we like to share our expertise, and if we are experts, why would we hide it? Um, and even as facilitators, capital F, um, fair enough. But then make it we can make it part of our signature. Um, and then it's very important just to be explicit about it um, and upfront with the group to have permission also to share that. This reminds me of, a, of, of something that happened in the workshop that Miriam and I did two days ago when we, we had an exercise where we where people uh, from, from a different section joined. A, it was an ideation session pretty, pretty much and they joined into ideas that had already been worked on. And what we said is that this is actually highly beneficial because you get a different perspective on the idea that's there and i do think as facilitators we have also the benefit here and there to do exactly that if we see that there's an exper external uh, pers perspective missing and we have an idea it's okay to throw it in if you feel like it. it doesn't always have to be and you have to feel comfortable with it but if you feel like it maybe this could just be the spark that the group needs as long as you can get out again and not uh interfere with any any uh, autonomy for example. And as long as you're not, if you don't have stakes in the outcome, because then it becomes difficult. I think it's okay to be opinionated and to have subject matter expertise, but if you are attached to a specific outcome, then it would be dangerous. I think if, if you're hosting a workshop where it's about abandoning meat consumption in the cafeteria and you're a vegetarian and then unconsciously or consciously or pushing the group um, towards voting or going in one direction um, for the green direction, I think it becomes dangerous. Then we're back to facipulation. Yeah. A, um, what I also find interesting, do we have time to speak to a few more? Yeah, we have. Um, is the, 
Or maybe you wanted to hear from someone else. We are speaking so much. Up what to you. you notice? Then I will take up the space. Um, usually I love to sit in silence, but this time time is too precious. Um, the agnostic facilitator, I built my own methods. Most of the group um, were on the, um, rather on the spectrum, I built my own methods in, instead of the niche facilitator, one method um, set will do. Um, and by that, and I wonder whether we have the same idea or what um, got you there. Would like to share. Oh, I'll share my journey. Um, I, so I, I kind of backed into facilitation. I had written a book and given talks that begged uh, workshops on the topic. And I think I had a background in education, so at least I was aware of like, the learners and, and then and the people in the room, what they needed. But um, definitely my earliest workshops were very much master class types of things with me monologuing. And I think it was over the course of a decade I started backing off more and more lecture and doing more and more activities. And at some point I realized I need to actually learn a bit about facilitation and how, how good facilitators work. So that was my journey starting off as a quote unquote expert and doing master class type things and ending up being more facilitative. And even now where I'm called in to be the expert on, you know, the things I've written a book on, I'm like, well, I'm going to create the discovery environment where they can discover the things I've learned on their own. So it's, it's been a complete shift in how I frame things. So now you're designing your own methods related to the subject matter expertise you brought in. Yep. That rather than telling them, like, <laughs> they can discover things on their own. Yeah. And that's what I find so beautiful about the professional facilitation, that the very small minority graduated from high school saying, I want to be a facilitator when I'm grown up. Um, so usually every one of us had a different career, different life before we started with a big F. One of facilitation. I think um, I think that um, I call them one night stand facilitators um, have a very bad reputation. Um, and I wonder where this comes from, whether it's um, the short term, the one off facilitation as opposed to the long term commitments. Um, I wonder whether it comes from a scarcity mindset, thinking that we do need to have several workshops, long term projects so that we get the books in, or whether it comes from the point of view that we cannot achieve anything in one workshop, which is another assumption that I dare to question. Well, I can I can just speak for myself since since the space is open. Um, I I had a long period struggling with one one night one night stand facilitations or however you label them now uh, because because of a different reason because I felt like I wanted to be part of that change that was hopefully going to happen after this workshop. Um, I felt almost like a FOMO of like what's going to happen after this. Um, and uh, almost like a feeling of being abandoned um and yeah they leave me behind after when actually the the rough work starts and and then i had a few longer term engagement and they bring completely different challenges and we've spoken about this you you somehow your role shifts a little bit you become this very familiar face which kind of brings you a lot closer to the group maybe maybe closer than you probably should be at one stage you develop relationships with different participants and are a bit tighter than with, with with other participants so there's a couple of those challenges along the way as well 
I think I, I, I would struggle with this one where to position myself because it's one thing is a preference. The other one is, is a practicality mindset on it. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> and I realized very quickly there, there are two things that I realized um, that I don't have to be ashamed of them. And I think it's also part of our conversations about facilitation signature. I initially was kind of ashamed that I was so structured and I mm. planned my workshops by the minute. And very often they work out as I structured and planned them. Um, and the other one was that I do like one of facilita um, facilitation gigs. Um, and I think depending on the goal of the client, we can achieve a lot in one, mm. one workshop. And I don't like the long-term commitment. I don't want a relationship with my clients. Um, and I saw that Stefan had a question. Yeah, um, I have a question about the bottom one. Uh, only results matter and it's all about the process. This one stuck out to me, uh, or I feel like all the others are a spectrum and we could debate or explain. I felt like this was kind of a false <laughs> dichotomy um, where it's like the results are why we're doing this and the process is the how. So it's like one serves the other. So I had trouble seeing what the spectrum even is here. Mm -hmm. And I guess, too, behind that, I've been through a lot of poorly facilitated workshops, which were all about going through the motion, going through the process, but there was no outcome. And I guess I have a reaction to facilitation theater. So when I looked at that, I was like, only results matter, right? And I, I'm the far <laughs> far right little icon there. And I'm trying, I'm trying to understand the other position or the other, the other views and why this would be a spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to jump into that. Um, for me, this is a spectrum because because we sometimes predetermine outcomes of a workshop, and I think that actually locks us into a mindset that blocks opportunities uh, from that come along the way. So this is why I'm also very emergent in my in my work. I understand that there's a previous idea about what should be the result of of this of this workshop, but if the workshop goes a different direction then we're going a different direction. And sometimes one of my favorite things in workshops is if, if my participants actually leave the workshop with a lots of with lots of question marks over their heads, which would never qualify as a result because it's actually something that, oh, what, what came out of this workshop? But I, often, I believe that we don't always have the answers at the end of the workshop. So I see, I see facilitators sometimes too focused that we have to land at a point because otherwise the workshop wasn't a success if we haven't landed on a workshop, if you haven't landed on a result, if you haven't landed on clear steps to take this forward. I don't believe that's always necessary. I believe that sometimes the process actually needs to follow where the, where, where the energy goes, where the ideas show up and see where we at the end can land it. We still land somewhere, but whether that's a result or whether that's just the cliffhanger to the next step, that for me is not is not so important. So for me, it's so me this, this dichotomy here is about the focus, right? So it's like, okay, do you focus on really following the process as the dynamic emerges, or do you focus on definitely achieving the result no matter how you get there? So these are the two things that I would put into this. Um, to plus one that I think that very often, and that's a big challenge of workshops. There's, there are so many emotions and so many endorphins that we produce throughout the workshop because we have all these conversations and it's a nice space and we're feeling heard and we're creative that what the group aligns on at the end, very often when they wake up the next morning, they don't really relate to it. They're like, How did I come up with that? So it's almost like after a party where they're like, oh, did I really commit to that? And I think this is something that we um, we are not discussing enough amongst facilitators and with our clients on how to deal with the biased results at the end, because either we are just tired or we want to get to a result because that's what we signed up for, or everyone is just so happy and aligned and full of endorphins um, that they just agree to anything. Um, and then Monday morning, nobody actually wants to do the work. Sorry for all the one night stand references. I am uh... <laughs> sad. Th th thanks very much. First, I just wanted to say that I love this 
this uh, whatever you're calling it, uh, facilitation spectrum, sorry, because it's really making me think about my style. It's one of the best that I've actually seen in a long time. So I don't know if you, if, if you can see this offline, but I, I would love to uh, to sort of keep reflecting on, on, on my spectrum. Um, I had two thoughts. One was sometimes people can see um, results as a solution. And sometimes I think I've had to work on just agreeing what the problem is <laughs> with the team and workshop that I'm facilitating. And that's just as powerful as as the solution or the result. If we can actually disagree, sometimes we've just abandoned what we, we would think we were going to do in favor of let's just spend all the time on agreeing the problem, then we can move forward. And the other thing that building on what the facilitator Saeed said about being water, I love that because it is about being fluid. And what my boss used to say, build got that analogy, he goes, we need to be fluid like water. So long as we know where the water is flowing, so long as it's all ending up in the same stream. So just building on that, that actually, I think you've got to just be quite adaptable as a facilitator. And that's one of the hardest skills that I've actually had to learn over the years is, is how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Miriam loves to ask a question in, in her and you ho hopefully all of you have heard the workshop works podcast uh and if not then you have work to do um she loves to ask a questions to to her interview partners and that's what makes workshops fail or when do workshops fail or how can we make workshops fail and stuff and i i remember my response to that now our conversation about it because i do not believe that they can fail uh they can fail if we set it up maybe against the the original outcome but if you look at it just simply as a learning space regardless of what learning that is, then then they technically cannot fail. They might not have achieved the client's uh, goal, but still there will be insights for the clients that come out of it. Um, and in that sense, the results is is ultimately always learning for me, right? Sometimes they're more concrete, sometimes they're less concrete and similar to what was just said. Sometimes it's just about finding out, okay, we have to work further on this. So results is also a, a very subjective term in many ways. It depends a bit on what you put into it. Um, and for me, as a facilitator, that mindset really helped because it didn't set me up for failure. Because I said, either way, I will anyway learn something out, out of this. But I, got, I, I also noticed that a lot of the participants learn days after, weeks after the workshop only, and not at the end of the day. Uh, they might not have all the answers to what they what they were looking for, all the solutions to their problems, etc. But that is a process that continues to work. And plus one to that, um, I think especially in the, the way how you facilitate, and I think I also tend to facilitate is we, we're inviting participants out of their comfort zones. So it is not comfortable. So they might actually dislike it or not feel happy about it um, at the moment. So they might not actually see the full spectrum or picture of the result and the real transformation they went through. Mm -hmm. And then it's only afterwards that they realize uh, once everything calmed down. And I must say that for me, some of the workshops that I learned the most and that I refer to most are the ones that I set in them and I hated every single moment mm. because they triggered me so badly. So yeah, the results also, what, what are we looking for? Are we looking for the results in the workshop or the long-term or the day after or the year after? And we're already running out of time. We're already approaching the end, yeah. Shall we have a, because we're a small group, can we have a popcorn takeaway checkout? Um, assuming that people know the popcorn, popcorn, um, you, we know from the cinema, popcorn pops whenever it's ready and everyone can only pop once. Um, so if you're ready to pop, uh, you can unmute yourself um, and share with us what is the one thing that um, you're taking away from this conversation, from this activity? I would like to start with, there is no black or white. Yeah, I wanted to share the same. So there is not one way, but there's lots of ways. It depends. I like what Sad said, um, that sometimes it takes a workshop or two to find out a problem, what a problem is. The 
the power of thought-provoking questions. Not letting our assumptions get in our after, way. After workshop realization. For me, I guess it was this, I, today we talked about facilitation, but I couldn't help but wonder how important it is to hold space for, to talk about extremes no matter where we are and to open up and say, hey, this is what the world looks like from, yeah, through my glasses and what does it look like through your glasses in light of everything that's happening in the world. I thought like, yes, we need more extremes that we can plot ourselves on and then have a healthy debate and a healthy curiosity conversation around our positioning in there and also allowing ourselves the grace to move. Okay, oh, I get that. I see what you mean. I'm moving a bit to the left. I'm moving a bit to the right. I really love that. Yeah, thank you. And I think what I, to build on that, what I'm taking away is that we need more of these conversations. I think every one of these um, spectrum scales could have had a individual conversation because there's also so much, um, so many assumptions behind all of them. Um, and I wonder if we had aligned on what it really means um, how different then it would look like and whether we could actually align on what the two extremes actually mean. Yeah, for me, final words maybe. Um, play with your spectrum. Uh, every, every excursion outside your preferences on the different spectrums will just expand you and help you grow as a facilitator and find new categories. We just su suggested a few, but facilitation is full of those. So enjoy that as well and let's bye. unmute all together and say bye bye yes and i also enabled the soundboard i want to thank miriam and thomas for bringing in the hot questions and for facilitating the conversation holding the space today and to all of you in the room for being here and tuning in and leaning in and sharing um a big round of applause there we go Let's make let's make uh, let's hit all the blows and whistles. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Thank you all. Thank you, Anna Maria, for the invite. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for contributing. Have a great rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Bye.